So as the announcer so graciously introduced me, um, my name is John Stegner, and I have served as the vice president of One in Four um, for this past year. And One in Four is an all-male sexual assault prevention group that takes its name from the 2008 statistic um, that one in four women, by the time they have turned 21, will survive an assault or an attempted assault. So in November, I gave a speech. It was a short five-minute speech for the TEDx student speaker competition, which I called a call for active passivity, which was essentially about men, feminism, and their relationship to gender-based violence. I gave that speech the night before the Rolling Stone article was published. And for about three months after that, I couldn't talk about or think about the speech. And it wasn't from the same procrastination that is the bane of whichever professor has me in their classroom. It was instead because I was nervous and afraid to channel the urgency that had so suddenly erupted on our campus. I felt afraid and unprepared. And I had worked in this issue for the past four years and had never felt so discouraged. And the worst part was that I couldn't even begin to understand why. And that's why about a month ago, um, or two months ago now, thanks to the snow, um, about two months ago, I sought out those whom I deeply respected within the undergraduate activist community, those whom I'm honored to call my friends and my colleagues in violence prevention. So I wanted to know, are you feeling this too? Are you feeling discouraged? Are you feeling unprepared? And they all said, yes, they were. And it turns out that we were only feeling more and more tense as the energy escalated. The difference between them and myself, however, was that they had very specific and tangible reasons for why they were so afraid. They felt the movement slipping away under the media's minimizing scrutiny on one event. They felt forward momentum stalled by a constant backwards focus. And they worried most of all that as normalcy returned to the university, so too would the same underestimation, apathy, or outright hostility towards the issue of gender-based violence. And unfortunately, these are justifiable concerns. We all know that the spotlight is pretty much gone for the university regarding sexual assault. They comply with all federal regulations and added a few of their own. They acted swiftly, and they avoided severe political pitfall. I know that we, as students and as faculty, are tired of grieving. We're tired of worrying. But a lot of us are tired of activism surrounding this issue. I know that I myself felt emotionally exhausted. And when I did locate the source of the negative feelings, it was that I finally felt a limit to how much good words themselves could do, how much we could talk about an issue before things finally started to change. And that's exactly what terrified me, because the patriarchy and the violence surrounding it is still firmly rooted on our grounds. And it will take much more than two months of simply screaming, we won't stand for this anymore, in order to eliminate its pervasive presence. However, while they did share with me several um, difficult and concerning fears, they also share with me one intensely positive and tangible benefit of the articles being published. And that was the fact that for the first time, almost every single person on this university finally realized that this problem even existed and how prevalent it actually was. So now we are about a month into, a month, well, more than a month into classes. Um, we just had spring break. The semester's coming to a close. And I do share a level of optimism I had not thought possible three months ago. We have a new level of commitment to this cause that we thought was going to be impossible. I mean, we at one in four even experienced double our usual 80 applications um, to be part of a, a part of the membership. People are excited. People want to move. People want to join groups. And we had more faculty engagement with this issue than we had ever seen before as well. So now that we have the most enthusiasm than we've had before, what can we do? Well, it turns out things have been continuing to go on about as normal. And that bothers me as well. The theme of this year's TEDx UVA conference is out of the cave. And I think that this platonic metaphor serves very well to talk about what happened to us last semester. Because we all saw walls of a cave disintegrate around us. We saw discourse around this issue transformed. We all were united as we noticed, finally, burned by the sun, those actions and people who were hurt. We finally noticed that there were mindsets that we had either ignored or even participated in, and we wanted to change things. For a long time, we reacted to the shockingly high numbers of nationwide violence um, statistics with 
a common misconception, a common disbelief. We said, well, the numbers are that high, but they can't be here. The numbers can't be that high here. But now with the scrutiny of a nation upon our university, we realize that yes, here, people are hurt every single day. And so the big idea for this TED Talk is quite simple. It's that as normalcy returns, as the parties begin again, we must remain vigilant and aware of our own mindset and our own community. We must remain out of the cave. And despite my somewhat tortured metaphor, this is not a vague or esoteric mission. In fact, it couldn't be more definite. So here are the numbers, here are the lives that we finally noticed as we left the cave. In 2009, and this is from the Center for Disease Control's National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. In 2009, 1.3 million women were raped or assaulted in the United States. That's the equivalent of 18 terrible, life-changing experiences every single minute in this country. Of these assaults, 81% of the survivors will experience significant short-term or long-term mental health impacts most commonly those associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, and they still have to get up for class in the morning. Of these assaults, only 5% will be reported to the proper authorities, making it the most underreported crime in America. And this number is even lower for male survivors of sexual assault, who comprise 3% of the US male population. Regardless of gender, the perpetrators of these crimes are 99% male. Now, these are difficult facts to process, especially when a CNN reporter is frantically calling you five times in a row while you're in the middle of an exam. And that actually did happen to a friend of mine whose sole condition for, be for giving an interview was that she'd be allowed to take a 20-minute nap. <laughs> um, so we in the undergraduate community are not sociologists or psychologists, we're not politicians or jurors, we're not experts on this issue. Instead, most of us are merely friends or partners of those who bear the terrible human toll of these statistics. We have friends who can't leave the house at night without gripping a pocket knife at all times. We have friends who sleep less than four hours every single night because of PTSD-infused nightmares. We have friends who don't leave their room because they retract into a spiral of shame and guilt, blaming themselves for everything that happened. We have friends who are isolated from their social community, because he would never do that. We have friends who stay in abusive relationships, because he won't ever do that again, and besides, I was asking for it. Many of us are not merely friends of these people. Many of us are these people. Many of us feel these effects ourselves, and that's what caused us to go into the work. For years, all of us have stood on the shoulders of those who wanted to end the pervasive quiet regarding what happens on grounds. All we know is compassion, empathy, kindness, and a few tools regarding how to deploy them in, si in different situations. Now, these tools are not miraculous advancements or, or some sort of technological achievement as one would expect from a TED Talk. One of the most common things that we offer, uh, sort of tactics, um, ways that we communicate um, particular concepts, involves bystander intervention. It's really simple. We use three Ds, distract, delegate, and direct. So distract, try to create a distraction in a problematic situation. Delegate, try to find a friend of the person or find support. And direct, merely go up to, the, to whatever the situation is and address it directly. Now, it's been incredibly effective in communicating um, sort of how to intervene in situations but it's also stupidly easy for such an incredibly difficult problem. So the question that we come across is, if the solutions are so simple, why aren't they being deployed? Why are the numbers so high? And it's then that I began to realize, around my third year, that in order for, there to ev for these tools to be even considered, much less used, First, men must realize that there is even a problem with this issue within society. They must realize that this problem directly affects both themselves and the people they care about, and they must find a way to escape their own guilt and their own discomfort in order to find the solution. And I say men here only because of the statistic that 99% of all of these perpetrators are males. 
Jesus is not trying to single out or pick on any specific group. And I'm not saying that men are inherently evil, or at least for my sake, I really hope not. Um, (laughs) So what keeps us from leaving is an imposed ignorance, guilt, and fear. And what we've been trying to do is essentially to break that down in order to finally approach men as allies. And unfortunately, it's not hard to see an active denial of the problem on grounds. So we at One in Four, typically what we do, as vice president, I essentially send out a lot of passive aggressive emails saying, you gotta show up to presentations. Um, And these presentations are typically about 40 minutes long and we we most likely, I say 99% of the time, present to fraternities. And so we offer these same statistics that I just brought up. And we convey the same emotion that I hope I convey right now. And yet the most common questions are not what is the cause of all this, or why has it been going on for so long, or what can we do to stop it? But instead, the most common questions that we get are, does it count as rape if we're both drunk? And what if she approaches me and lies and says that I raped her? Will I be found guilty? And it's at this point that it's very easy to get frustrated. I get frustrated with a society that enables this type of selfishness, to be able to look out at 1.3 million people who are suffering and to find the one example in which it could affect them negatively. I get frustrated because it's more than likely that there is this male survivor of sexual assault within the audience who now won't feel comfortable bringing it up to some of the people to whom they consider themselves closest. I get frustrated because oftentimes in these groups they have no problems making universalizing statements such as man up or grow some balls when it comes to taking creative risks or being bold, but yet when there is ever the remotest insinuation that someone in their gender is capable of violence, it becomes hashtag not all men. But it's at this point also that I realized I needed to step back. In my third year of studies, I really considered leaving the the intervention community. I I felt like I was hitting my head against a wall. I felt like no one really wanted to listen. And it was then that I read a really, I think, poignant but very simple quote from Dorothy Edwards, who currently leads the Green Dot program that's been recently training faculty, students, and administrators on grounds. So she had a very simple statement. She said, the vast majority of men are already anti-rape. They already want to help. They simply need the tools to do so. And it was then that I realized I had never met a man who was actively hostile towards violence prevention. I'd never met a man who thought that rape was totally fine. I had, however, met men who couldn't leave their own feelings of guilt aside in order to finally make progress on this issue. I've met men who were scared of any insinuation that they could possibly be complicit in such a terrible crime, in such a terrible society that allows this crime to happen. So most of us last semester, however, were forced to finally leave these feelings behind. We were forced to finally address the issue to say, yes, people are hurting, what can we do? And in fact, that was the title of a presentation that we gave, along with several other groups, Um, to a bunch of students, I think it was about 600 people came. It was incredible, and it was called What Can We Do? Because we knew we needed to push people in the right direction. We had that moment of empathy when people finally realized that we need to change something. So what we need then, currently, right now, in the next semester, and in the next semesters to come, is a resurgence of that same empathy that once flourished on our grounds. And it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to require a dramatic shift on par with that of the Rolling Stone article's publishing. And it's going to be difficult, and I am probably, I think one of the best ways I can bring, bring up how difficult it will be is to look at a case example. One of the things that we in One in Four face most often that is a block to progress on the issue of sexual assault, and that's survivor blaming, or the destruction of a sexual assault survivor's story with questions such as, what were you wearing? or um, how much did you have to drink, or did you lead him on? Now these questions are as frequent as they are horrifying, but more likely than not, they're either asked by people who are ignorant or people who genuinely mean well. So when when people ask these questions, most of the time they're involved in an active meaning-making process. They're faced with a great human tragedy. Someone has come to them and told them that this violence has happened to them. They can't understand it. And so what they want to do is to try to construct the narrative for this tragedy and the potential solution. 
So what these people who ask these questions fail to realize is that hundreds of thousands of women and men who have either directly experienced the issue or spent a lifetime studying it have already provided the answers. Sexual attraction is by no means the primary motivation for sexual assault, nor is being drunk an excuse for hurting somebody any more than being drunk excuses a hit and run in a car accident. So what the feminist response has essentially been has been to collect and synthesize data surrounding the, surrounding the issue of sexual assault and the primary motivations, and to issue a collective call for male empathy, passivity, and respect for women during intimate encounters. And so basically what we can look at survivor blaming as being is it is a counterpoint to the feminist response. It takes all of the blame away from the perpetrator of the crime and places it onto the survivor, him or herself. So were they wearing something too revealing? That's the story. What's the solution then? Wear more clothes. Were they leading someone on too much? Well, then they need to stop being a tease. Men are just built that way. And I think the phrase just built that way really encapsulates what the cave itself is, because it suggests that men neither can nor should be able to change. Of course, this flies in the face of psychological and sociological evidence, but nevertheless, it is the most ingrained narrative and solution we have for sexual assault um, within our nation. And then the question is, why? Well, I believe the answer lies within the theories of the French philosopher Michel Foucault, who did about as much cultural spelunking as I think any one person did. He suggested that the way that power in society works is not just through blunt physical force, such as a sexual assault or domestic violence, but also through knowledge itself or the narratives and solutions for societal problems. So in this case, survivor blaming is creating both the narrative and the solution and thus represents the discourse surrounding the issue. And it also represents the needs of those who are in power. Foucault would say, of course, it is the most common method. It serves the male patriarchy, which is primarily the center of power within the nation. So with that in mind, um, I believe that we saw a profound societal shift, if only temporarily, for about two months from November to December, and then continuing a bit on into January and February. But lately, I've been asked several different policy questions that I believe reflect society's reining itself back in. Because it's only within a patriarchal society, a survivor-blaming society, that these questions would even be considered legitimate. I've been asked things like, is guilt, I mean, is belief more important than justice? Are feminists trying to take away, to destroy the legal system? And should we always believe someone, even if it means insinuating someone else is guilty? Now, I've never read a single feminist think piece or any article supporting survivors that also advocated for the destruction of the legal system or the destruction of responsible journalism. It just doesn't happen. No one within our society should be able to act as a judge and a jury, weighing facts and collecting evidence for people who come to them with these stories. In fact, that's the primary problem with survivor blaming in the first place. It's attempting to dictate what the person's story is. It's attempting to find out exactly what happened, which can lead the person only into further guilt and further shame. But Foucault essentially reveals to us a, um, a national perspective from a wide angle lens. And he shows us that if we're going to change the ways that we view survivors, we're going to have to change the society around it and it, that will be nigh impossible. So what then is the solution? Well, I believe that I can propose the solution within two simple questions. And the first one is, if Jackie was your friend, subject to the Rolling Stone article, and approached you with her story, would you have immediately tried to collect evidence? Would you have immediately tried to corroborate witnesses' stories and to determine exactly what happened? Or would you try to help a friend who's in pain? And the second story, the second question is, does the fact that someone can lie about a crime therefore justify the crime itself? Should we stop bothering about asking for consent if people could lie about it anyway? And I believe the answer to these questions is pretty clear. It's absolutely not. You would help someone. And a crime is not justified merely because someone can abuse that system of trust. 
We, unless we are holding a pen in our hand or a gavel aloft, we have no place to judge the survivors of a crime that is so little, so little often reported and is so often judged. And if that story does come into question, then we have no reason to feel guilty because we supported a friend in that time. So the most radically feminist position that we can take is really to work within our microsystem, within our small communities. We can just affirm our friends and be able to be considerate and cautious during even the most passionate moments. And the solution also draws us further inward to our own actions. We don't need a megaphone or a full-time commitment to be a gender-based violence activist. In fact, without personal action and accountability, activism is utterly meaningless. Anyone these days can like a Facebook post, anyone can write a blog, anyone can give a speech that says assault is wrong. The solution instead begins when we're at a bar, we see a guy pressuring a girl, and we say, hey man, that's not cool. Or we try to find a friend. The solution begins when we ask before taking off someone's shirt. The solution is devastatingly simple, but it involves every single one of us taking responsibility for ourselves and making decisions. It begins when we legitimately adapt as men, as women construct their own narratives and their own solutions for an issue that directly affects their life and their well-being. And it begins when we adapt to those same narratives and solutions. We as students had to accept last semester that we're not kids anymore, that we are capable of causing great amounts of pain, and that there are thousands around us who are experiencing great amounts of pain as well. We have to be willing to accept the world as it is and to make changes, even if it means that we feel guilty, even if it means that we mess up sometimes, because that's the way out of the cave. And now we're faced with a choice. We can try to return to a normal society where we feel comfortable, but violence happens all around us, unspoken about. Or we can choose to stay. We can choose to make the decision to be aware at all times. And it's only within that new society that we'll find lives that are saved, violence that is prevented, and survivors who are supported. Thank you.